Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Hello, this is Matthew McCabe. Welcome to another edition of Miracle Voices. I'm here with my co-host, Tam Morgan. Tam, how are you doing today? Really well. Thank you so much, Matt. Good. Looking good. forward to, to today's podcast. Yes. And we have someone on with us today, our guest, Derek Carlson. Derek, welcome to Miracle Voices. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Derek, tell us where you're sitting in the world today. I am sitting about 70 miles east of Los Angeles, California, in a small, no, not small, but in a town called Redlands, California. Okay. Tam, and where are you today? I am in Oakland, California. Today. Okay. And I am on the south coast of Portugal. So oh. it's very similar weather for all of us. <laughs> wow. I wish I was there. <laughs> you are right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Derek, what a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, really looking forward to it. Why don't we just jump in right with how A Course in Miracles came into your life? Well, <laughs> I was reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, um, or however you pronounce his name, back in 2002. And somewhere at the beginning of that book, he mentions A Course in Miracles. And even he said something about sort of how it gave him some understanding or context for what had happened to him because he didn't understand the experience that had happened to him. And I thought, huh, this, you know, Course in Miracles, what that seems significant. So I think I went down to the Barnes and Noble or something at the time and uh, bought a copy. So that's when it came into my life. Great. And how did it kind of evolve in, as, into a practice for you? And did you see any changes as you started to get into it? Well, I picked it up and read perhaps a page, maybe a couple pages, and sort of being a raised atheist, uh, not raised atheist, I, that, I cooked that up myself. Um, I saw all the references to Christianity and, and I thought, you know, that, that, that rubbed me the wrong way. And, and then it seemed incomprehensible. Like, how could these high-level con concepts or philosophical ideas help me in a practical way? Because I was doing a lot of you know, personal development work and you know, personal development seminars, and they were rubber meets the road. What are you committed to? You know, take action. And here, this, the first couple of pages was just so theoretical. I, I just, you know, I, I put the book away for, you know, maybe... Um, a couple of years or something. And uh, then while dealing with tremendous depression, I just felt myself called to pick it up, um, you know, a couple of years later, and I kind of walked down to the local Starbucks and started thumbing through it. And this time, for some reason, it, it had some traction. And uh, so I started reading it at Starbucks um, over and over and over again. And uh, didn't do the practices. I was just sort of buried myself in the text. Still didn't have a clue what I was reading, but it had my attention. And, and then I put it down for a year or two. And then it, it called to me again. And I picked it up again and started reading it. And then maybe that second time, about five years later, I read through the entire thing. And then I started doing the um, exercises. Uh, and I got to, you know, number 30 the first time. And then I put the whole thing away for another year. I picked it up again and I got to exercise 60 or less than 60. Yeah, so, so it's been on and off for the whole 20 years uh, that I've been doing it. And I kind of get really into it for anywhere from a few months to a couple of years intensely. And then I'll, I'll put it down for, you know, a year or two. And, and that's kind of how it's been going. Cool. 
Yeah, I I had a similar experience where I I think it's very common. I would say you've probably heard this a million times, Tam. You pick it up and it's like, wow, I feel like this is like there's a message here, but it's encoded in a Rubik's cube, <laughs> and I can't understand how to like twist this and like how to get the message out. And then I read uh, Course in Miracles Made Easy by Alan Cohen, and then Disappearance of the Universe by Gary Renard, who's been on. And uh, I was like, oh, this is what it's trying to say. Now I like have a better orientation and can just jump in. But it's, you know, it just starts out so complex. And so like it's so high level that it's just so uncompromising that it's hard to digest sometimes if you're just walking into it out of the blue. Well, I I had a different experience in that, you know, I kind of starting 15, 16, grew up with Helen and Bill and Ken in my home for two years. I went to college. (laughs) I never opened it. And then I got to college and I ended up being a religion major. And I wrote a 50 page paper on the course without ever having read it. (laughs) So then like, it, you know, it kind of, I I would just open up a quote and start writing about it. Um, I would love to have that paper now to read whatever I thought it said, but um, it was kind of funny. And, you know, it, it, worked its way into my life as it does with so many people, but uh, it took me, what, about 30 years to really open it up and go, I should, I should take a look at this. Hmm. Uh, Were were Ken, was he, were they talking about this with you at this time when you were that age, like Ken and Bill and Helen, were they talking about course concepts with you or just what what was going on? They were talking with each other about it. They were like, every meal they were there almost every day um every single day you know and then bill would stay for dinner and helen would come you know for the afternoon so when i come home from school when i was not at school they were there talking about this and talking about the concepts and and jabbing each other and playing with their dynamics and i thought they're not really practicing this stuff or are they (laughs) you know like like i saw the underbelly of uh of that world and you know i would make my mother really i'd try and get her as angry as i could and right before she'd get angry like just when she's on the verge of yelling at me i would just say you're not practicing the course <laughs> I, oh. you know, I was that horrible teenager oh. <laughs> you know the precise weapon to use right oh yeah it was really good it was really good. <laughs> oh. the course became my friend in that way and it actually <laughs> brought me all the way through even when i came to to step in and work here to look at some of the teachers and say that to them, but because I, I held no accountability, I wasn't, you know, practicing the course. So I could say to them, I don't think this is practicing the course of your teacher here. And I could bring it up without having to say, well, I am, you know, and compare with, but I'm in a little different position now. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. What a clever way for a teenager to get that leverage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Teenagers are clever with all leverage. Well, Derek, you have some some great forgiveness stories, and we want to get into uh, at least one or two here today. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about uh, an experience with a house you owned and the forgiveness uh, opportunity there. Yeah. Um, should I just start out with sort of the the, the story in brief, and then you can kind of yeah, just uh, uh, just give us some context of what happened, uh, you know, how you own this house and and then what happened and how it became a forgiveness opportunity for you. Okay. Um, let's see. So um, I uh, split up with my girlfriend of about four years and then, you know, maybe six months or a year after that, um, her and her new boyfriend wanted to buy a house, but they didn't have the, uh, um, uh, you know, the credit or the, the income to do it. So she asked me to co-sign and I didn't realize until later, but now I know that I felt really guilty because during the four years that I was with her, I was very depressed. And I mean, this is just something I was dealing with. And now I have a lot of compassion for myself, but at the time I judged myself and hated myself, mostly subconsciously, but also, uh, you know, I was aware of, of the self-judgment that, you know, I, I, I wasn't happy. I brought her down my dark energy, you know, uh, ruined things. So anyway, when a year after we had broken up, she asked me to co-sign for the house, 
my guilt caused me to want to do anything that I could to help her because I quote unquote had so much to make up for um, because of how bad I was for four years. So um, jumping into a big commitment like that based on guilt um, was what turned out to be one, one heck of the beginning of a, of a lesson. And what happened was we did that. We bought the house together, you know, and she moved into it with her husband and I was just a co-signer on it. I never you know, put any money into it. And then a couple years in, she uh, fell into, you know, lost her job and, and couldn't make payments and um, uh, started missing payments. And, uh, you know, both of our credit scar- scores are, pummel- are, are plummeting. And she started um, going through sort of all these manipulative gyrations for how to, re- you know, re- redo the loan and this, that, and the other. And they were you know, I, I, they didn't feel like good energy. It didn't feel right to me. Um, but she had, you know, kind of like, I, I had no leverage in the situation. So I remember, so I don't, I don't know how to sort of convey um, the degree to which um, being, having no power, she called the shots. I was be, sort of beholden to the situation and there was there was nothing that I saw that I could do except for acquiesce to whatever her demands were. You know, I need you to go meet this person and re-sign these papers and do this and do that. And I'm thinking, you know, my credit score is plummeting. You are in a bad situation. We should really just sell the house. You know, then it's just, that's the clean thing to do. Um, But, you know, she wouldn't do that. So anyway, um, I was so infuriated one day being stuck in this powerless situation and I was pacing um, up and down my kitchen. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, she's got a gun to my head and I, I just, ah, I wish I had the gun and I wish I, I put that gun to her head. And the second that I said that in my mind, for some reason, something happened. I just froze. And then a new thought just hit me out of the blue and it hit me emotionally. I got touched and I got teary and it, it it even affects me now. The new thought was, I don't No, I don't. I don't want a gun to her head. I don't want her to have a gun to my head. I don't want anybody to have a gun to anybody's head you know, we're, we're the same. We're both scared. She's scared because she, you know, she lost her job and is about to be, you know, have to be kicked out of her house and all this stuff. She's scared. I'm scared because um, she's controlling me. And, and uh, I get, I guess that's the first place I'd like to come up for air and, and see if you have any questions at that point um, is that uh, that's when forgiveness hits spontaneously out of the blue. Yeah. So you mentioned guilt there, you know, prominent theme in uh, the course and kind of a special relationship. I think there's nine chapters on <laughs> special relationships in the course. I yep. think I got that right. Yep. And uh, guilt is just a huge theme there. So you felt like, hey, if if I was a bad boyfriend, I brought uh, bad energy to the relationship Um, Now I have this opportunity to kind of make a gift to make amends for it, but it's not done out of a place of, of love. It's done out of a place of, I need to repair this because of something inherently wrong with what I brought to the relationship. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was kind of casting out like that from beginning with this loan? Did that kind of, uh, did that kind of imbue a certain quality to it that kind of uh, you know, put a shadow on the the loan from the beginning, you think? Yeah, I think you just articulated the whole situation. I couldn't have articulated it better than you just did. And the, the way the whole thing ultimately unfolded, which we may or may not get to the second half of the story, depending on time, but the way it ultimately unfolded, um, 
after that moment, there were still several years where there was a lot of back and forth between the two of us. She, she stayed in that house for another two or three years before she ultimately, we ultimately sold it. Um, and during that time, those two or three years, um, I was severely triggered um, over and over and over again. And as I did that, different types of, of anger and judgment were coming out of me. And I was, I was working with a therapist. I was journaling. I journaled hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, I was doing the Course in Miracles lessons. I was praying to the Holy Spirit that my um, judgments of, of her, judgments of myself, um, like the feeling guilty for the bad boyfriend and being a bad person and that sort of stuff, um, my judgments of... I'm a victim to uh, these external things uh, being tied to this loan and my credit score plummeting. All of those judgments um, came up. And, and like I said, I worked with them a lot myself, like me in the journal and what do I believe and what's true? You know, so there's a lot of, you know, just me and myself. And at the same time, there was a lot of me letting go of that and and asking the Holy Spirit help me see this differently, help me clear these these judgments, these beliefs. I d- I don't want to believe them. I don't want to hold on to them. And I feel like going back to what you articulated, the original guilt that I had of myself being a bad boyfriend was actually the tip of the iceberg, because the reality was there was guilt for being a human being with judgments and a human being who was vicious and malicious, but tried to hide all those tendencies uh, under the guise of I'm an, I'm a nice person. I'm, you know, so I had this whole false front that I kind of used in life that was hiding tons of, of self judgment. And so the, the obvious guilt, and then all of this buried self hate and self judgment, I feel like, this experience that I went through with her and, and the house was that lesson that God would have me learn. It forced me to look at all of this dark stuff inside of me that I didn't even know was there because it wasn't triggered. And this situation was so intense that it shined a light on, on all of this, you know, dark stuff under the carpet or in the closet, however you want to put it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think what you said was, was dead on. It, it, um, part of this makes me smile because we all have those experiences that you dug and you dove so deep in to, um, to work it through is extraordinary. And your commitment to years of this work on that, you know, there's a a line, uh, in the course that says the home of vengeance is not yours. The place Mm -hmm. you set aside to house, and I will use that word to house your hate is not a prison but an illusion of yourself and uh and also do not this is why i love the web edition you can put in a word and it will bring up the things that feel so relevant you know do not try to make this impoverished impoverished house stand Mm. so much of it needed to fall apart for you to get to your to your own truth here and a, a third one that just came up and i, I have to read it because all of these just came through to me um is each body seems to house house a separate mind a disconnected thought living alone and in no way joined to the thought by which it was created and you started this story to us telling us how you had this incredibly separate mind uh and alone and you realized she was indeed the same as you Mm -hmm. And it started to unfold this process of forgiveness that I'm so glad you're on this end of it, you know, to to talk about it, because what a journey. Yeah. And I want to say that when this happened, I was about 10 years practicing the course and was starting to starting to get a grasp of what the course was really talking about in terms of forgiveness and, and this arbitrary ego mind that was, you know, hating and projecting. Um, And so if I hadn't been studying the course and other related things, then I, I don't think I would have had the wherewithal to go, Oh my goodness, this is an opportunity 
for me to work with myself and clear a lot of this garbage out of my mind, which is why I did all the journaling, all the therapy, all the prayer. And, and, because if I hadn't had that context, I think I would have put my energy into finding a lawyer, uh, making her wrong, finding friends to complain about her, about the situation, um, resent. I, I just would have put my energy in a whole different place. And I almost certain that the outcome would have been phenomenally different and the, the healing would not have happened. And a lot of other, even worse things would have happened. So I'm so thankful for the course, uh, being in my life prior to that. What a great use of it. Yeah. How and did, go ahead, Derek. Oh, I, I just, another thought popped into my head that I wanted to say, which was, um, from practicing the course for 10 years, you know, I would ask the Holy spirit to help change my mind on many things, um, as part of lessons. And I would just start to get in the habit of doing that in life. And I don't know that I would, I can't think of a story right now where, where I, I asked that and I noticed my mind change by an hour later or the next day. I, it probably did, but I don't have any, any stories. So after 10 years of asking and, and not really noticing anything happening, um, I wasn't sure that what, you know, that the Holy spirit was really could help me or that my practice was even helping me. But what I think is when I told that story about how in the kitchen, I was attacking her in my mind. And then I froze and spontaneously a forgiveness thought came into my mind without me even consciously asking the Holy spirit, my sort of take on this, and maybe Tam, you can give me your thoughts on this but is that all of that practice for the 10 years prior was sort of building a momentum or building a muscle of forgiveness of asking for forgiveness. And that when I really needed it in that really intense moment, all that prior practice finally was present so that the forgiveness could come in spontaneously. Um, is that, that's, that's my take. Is that. I, I, I would agree completely with that take and as you said the building the muscle when it kicks in as muscle memory mm -hmm. uh, where you don't have to remind yourself but it's finally brought it in and the beauty of your story is that even at, like that kicked in after 10 years but then there was another several years of doing the actual practice within it yeah and and so the forgiveness moment came but the continuation of its unfolding and the work that it then brought you still stayed you stayed around for and you know sometimes in a path of awakening um what i've noticed is there are people who have this incredible moment of enlightenment yeah and then they spend a lot of time trying to get back to that moment of enlightenment mm -hmm. uh and and the nurturing the flame and the continuing to be in the present with what is and work it through um, is, is there's a commitment to that, which actually the course gives and applied principles of all the tools. We're, we're not going to change necessarily the outside world. It's how we move inside. Sometimes it takes an instant and you don't have to do any more work. Mm -hmm. Other times it takes an instant and you have to see that that gift is, as you said, uncovering all the darkness that isn't true anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, along maybe your next step is in forgiveness is, oh, I don't even have to do those extra years. Got it. Right. Um, and that's developing muscle memory. So, mm. you know, we all have our ways and our times of learning. Yeah. I, this is uh, loosening the pickle jar for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like I that. Do. Metaphor. I do too. That's great. So. Oh, gosh. Yeah, well, Derek, work. interested in when you're going through these the kind of change of perception and in the kitchen or afterwards, did you have any kind of physical ways you felt you were processing the forgiveness that you could talk about? Um, Convulsions or? Yes, yes, like yes. Yeah, that, that was something I wanted to mention is that the, um, probably the two or three months prior 
to ultimately selling the house and being free from this whole dynamic entirely um, is when the, the fear daily was almost like life and death. And I, I thought that, I mean, it's not rational now, but it was visceral in my body. And I thought, you know, she's going to try to do something shady and, and, you know, there's going to be something wrong with the house that she doesn't disclose. And then the buyers are going to, uh, you know, uh, find out, and then they're going to sue us. And then I'm going to lose everything. And then I'm going to be in prison for the rest of my life because I, I mean, literally the, the fear and the thoughts were that, out of proportion with what, what a reasonable person would be like, it's, it's probably going to work out. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you might have to pay them a few thousand, no big deal. But, but for me, it's almost like this, this whole process was just a metaphor for this, you know, inner clearing of hell. And so since it was hell in my mind, it was experienced as life or death and terrifying. And, so you know, one time I was, you know, got off the phone with the real estate agent and completely went into a terrified state. And then I went to take a bath and I started shaking uncontrollably for a good 15 or 20 minutes in the bathtub. Not, not quite grand mal seizures, but seizure like activity and terrified my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And that happened two or three more times, just laying in bed and, you know, going to bed at night and with my head freaking out about what's going to happen. And, you know, it's like, I wish I could say that me doing all of this journaling work and this therapy work and trying to clear out all the negativity was all motivated by my commitment to the light commitment to healing, but it was actually all of these terrifying thoughts, mental states, emotional states, and physical convulsions and pain made me go you know, the very next morning I would wake him and go, Derek, you, you pray journal, clear it out, let go of these beliefs. You know, it, it, the, 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 the fear of just all of that pain was what really drove me to do as much work as I could um, in hopes that quote unquote, it would save me in, in the sense of Derek, not, not being in such emotional terror and not, you know, having these convulsions and, and maybe not even having the real estate deal go bad. Um, so, so there was in a sense, some external drive, I, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's complex. It was, it was an internal commitment, but was also also driven by external, all those external factors as well. Well, it is complex and, you know, you're apparently and obviously a complex creature uh, who's extremely sensitive. So, so your physical being would reflect um, what you're going through in that way. And again, I say that the commitment, you know, spirit uses what it can use. And, mm. it, you know, it used the story, even the course to help you um, hold on. And it also sometimes uses the pain. Mm. You know, it's not real, mm -hmm. but experienced is real. And, and if you can find something good about it to work through uh, to get to a better place, um, I mean, for where, where I come from, it's the foundation for inner peace. To find your foundation of inner peace amidst all this, your body may still be in pain and it may not. And the situation may change and it may not. But as a motivating factor to get you to a better place, um, it's going to use it. That and makes yours, sense. Yours is always the choice. Do I want it to be used or do I want to keep these other thoughts? Every mm. moment you get that choice. Which one do I want to connect with now? And then, mm. you know, part of you in the beginning was connecting with, I want that choice because I want peace. I want mm. that choice because I want peace. But you were, you know, you were still in the story of it because it yep. was so strong. And it's, it gets, you know, we believe this illusion. We believe it with everything we have. We get invested in it. And you were financially invested, emotionally. It's like every part of you was invested. You were housing it in your body as mm -hmm. well. But the remembering, oh, this actually isn't real, sounds like it started to loosen you a bit. Yes, it did. And 
I, I feel called to just sort of jump to one of the uh, blessings that came out of it, which was, um, I, as all as all this sort of cleared right right towards the end, um, I, I was sort of the, the the process sort of helped me develop kind of new I don't know what you call maybe uh, self worth beliefs or change my personality characteristics. And, you know, previously there was that subconscious hating myself for being a bad person. And so I, I didn't assert myself in life. I didn't have self-worth. I didn't have boundaries. I let, I either let people roll over me, or if they started to roll over me, I would just viciously attack back. There was no, there was no loving power. Um, there was no clarity. There was no strength. And, um, through this whole experience, I got clear on that whole dynamic. And since then, to a, to a large extent, uh, and it's been growing in strength, this, this ended about four or five years ago. Um, we sold the house about four or five years ago. But now I've found that, you know, if a situation doesn't feel right, um, often, sometimes I'm still triggered. Um, but in many situations, I just recognize what's going on. And I know what my values are. And I, I can speak up for myself and I can say, you know, yes, this deal feels good. No, that deal doesn't feel good. I'm sorry. You're going to have to ask somebody else to do that. And there's just such a change in my ability to be powerful. And I notice that when I'm powerful, I don't attack and I don't become vicious because there's no need to be that way when I'm so grounded and centered and in, in love and strength. Um, so, so that was a blessing that came out of this, all this, all the work that I did to get through to the other side. It's beautiful. It's amazing that the, uh, the house is a symbol here and even, <laughs> even, even mortgage, the word mortgage means, uh, death contract. I don't know if you know that come from the French words, mort and get mortgage, mm -hmm. those two words together. And it's like people listening to this might be like, well, you know, Derek is, is he making the, like a too big a situation out of this? It's like, it's a bad situation, no doubt about it, but does it require like these seizures and all this and the symbol of the house and the loan and the relationship, it's, it, it doesn't even necessarily matter. It's just, you know, you decided to let these feelings come up out of the subconscious mind and they're terrorizing you. And it's like, you, you, you chose to do something about it. You know, you're, your decision-making mind. You're looking at this. I'm praying, I'm journaling, I'm reading uh, spiritual texts. And uh, I, I've, I've definitely been there myself. I know exactly what you mean. And it's like the conscious mind is saying, well, I shouldn't be, this is, this shouldn't be causing this much upset. This, right. should, this is millions of people deal with this every year without going into right. seizures. And here I am. And it's like, no, that's just the symbol that uh, we're projecting it on. And these terrible, terrible thoughts are just coming up from the unconscious to the conscious mind. It's amazing. Wow. That's, I, I never realized it until you just said it, that, that the whole, your home and mortgage and how it's such a, a great metaphor for what it meant to me and what I went through. Yeah. Gosh. So much we could talk about here. Just so much yeah. symbolism going on. <laughs> yeah, pull one little string, and it really goes deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, can I? I just want to fit. I just looked at my notes here. I just want to fit, finish with one thing. Um, so, coming out of this whole thing, forgiveness. Um, how did it transform the relationship? Was your question to me in that questionnaire? And I realize now, in retrospect, is that. It you know it transformed I, I transformed the relationship with myself and with the Holy Spirit, like we just talked about, and that was everything for me. Um, that was what truly mattered and what was was a miracle, um, and it has completely transformed my life. So that's the biggest thing. But I was also looking, and I'm like, well, this is interesting. It just so happens that in one case, the external situation of being beholden to this house, um, that completely resolved itself. The, the house sold just fine. And she made a lot of money on it. And I got a cut of that money. So I made a fair amount of money. So that piece of external reality worked out very, quote unquote, gracefully 
um, or beneficially. Um, but the relationship with my ex and her husband, who I, I in my heart, I, I care about them. I want the best for them. I don't hold any, uh, any more malice in my heart um, after working through all this. So I want the best for them. But I think that they took this whole situation very personally. And I, my guess is that they never want to speak to me again. And they may be, may be internally harboring pretty you know, bad feelings about me. So that external relationship between me and her uh, from an external perspective, that isn't all happy and pretty and we haven't hugged and forgiven and we're still in touch. You know, that's completely disconnected in, 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 in form. So I'm just noticing that the, you know, forgiveness, it, it may lead to a, a positive change in form or it may not, but what really matters is the peace that I now have within my own mind and heart. Um, so I just wanted to sort of wrap it up with that. That's great. Great way, great way to wrap that up. Great flourish to the ending here because it's like you don't always get the, the results you think you want in form like a storybook uh, happy ending. So thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah, completely. It's, um, it, it, isn't about, it isn't about changing the world on the outside. Right. If it was, I'd have six packs, six pack abs. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> well, Derek, you've got another story of forgiveness that we wanted to touch on here um, around fibromyalgia. Would you mind just briefly giving some context and background on that and uh, your healing journey there? Yeah, that, that one's a much shorter story. Um, I've, I've been dealing with, you know, body pain, muscle pain, joint pain. Um, it started in my teens and it just got slowly worse and worse. And I tried lots of different things over the decades and spent uh, tens of thousands of dollars on, you know, chiropractic and physical therapy and Feldenkrais method and Rolfing and, you know, all these physical modalities. And then of course I, you know, been doing inner child work and trauma resolution work and all sorts of psychological modalities and visualizing and meditating and journaling and you, you name it. I've, I've been trying to solve this physical pain problem using every tool I could find for, for decades. And, and it's frustrating because it's just gotten on a steady decline, worse and worse and worse over the years. And then about two years ago, um, I had, I came out of what I think the course would call a period of unsettling, but I, I had a psychological nervous breakdown, um, about four years ago and it lasted for two years. And when I, when it lifted, which is a, its own miracle story in its own right, it sort of that mental breakdown just stopped one morning. But since that moment, the fibromyalgia pain, it got like a lot worse. Um, I want to, I want to be melodramatic and say it got like 10 times worse. Um, but it, it got so bad to where I couldn't just shake it off or ignore it, you know, and twist my neck side to side and just keep going. Um, I would have days where I, I I couldn't go to work and I had to take, you know, I do have to take hot baths and, and, you know, throughout the day. And then I take lots of aspirin and then I sleep throughout the day. And I just, it's so bad that I can't in, really endure it. And, and I don't have any solution for it. And that happens once or twice a week uh, currently. And the thing around forgiveness that I, that I sort of wanted to, to, to mention about this whole thing is that um, just recently, this has been going on for 25, 30 years, and I've been doing the course for on and off for 20 years. And only since it's gotten really bad in these last two years, have I found myself really committing to the course lessons. And I am not a, I'm not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. And, and this pain and these waves of pain hit uh, for these one or two days at a time where they get really bad. And I just focus my mind on, on shifting my heart or my desire to where I want my, my desire is to not be identified with this pain and, and not be identified with the body and to know the truth so that I can have peace of mind, even while being in physical pain. 
Uh, and I'm that's so, so that's what I try to do these days. And what I've noticed is that since I've been trying to do that so much for two years now, um, because I didn't try previously, because I could just sort of shake it off. So now that now that it's become so 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 much of, a, of an effort, um, I've noticed that for maybe a day or a day and a half, I can hold that practice to where I'm 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 talking to Holy Spirit and I'm asking for my mind to be changed, so I'm not uh, completely believing I'm a body in pain and you know all these ego beliefs, which is like, if I was just felt good as a body, life would be great. And, right. it, and there's that competition of, am I, am I going to want the ego's desires or am I going to want to free my mind? And then one path goes one way and one path goes the other way. And now it's about a day and a day and a, or a day and a half where I can hold that intention of wanting to free my mind or wanting peace of mind. And then after a day or a day and a half, I can't do it anymore. And I just get frustrated. And I, I say, screw this, screw the Holy Spirit, screw trying to, trying to practice this. I don't care anymore. I just want to feel better. And I, I, it, it's a mixture of anger and pity um, that lasts for you know maybe another day or two. And I'm just like, screw it. And, and I think of um, the bald guy in the matrix, his, the guy, I think his name was Cypher. Yeah. And he was eating that steak in that one scene. And he goes, I don't care. I don't want to know the truth. Plug me back into the matrix. Steak feels good. Ignorance is bliss. And that's sort of where the pain gets me to after about a, a day or a day and a half to where I'm like, forget it. I just, I'm, I'm just going to be an ego and I'm just going to want to feel physically better. And that's all I freaking care about. Yeah. So what I'm sort of noticing is that the same, same as what Tam was saying uh, to me before about how all of the practice little by little builds a muscle. I'm, I'm thinking instead of looking at me right now uh, that I fail in my commitment after a day or a day and a half, you know, I, I can't hold it. I just totally identify with the ego uh, again and again and again. And I could look at it as failure, 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 failure. But what I'm starting to realize is that each time the pain hits and each time I really reach for the Holy Spirit and I really reach for peace of mind for that 12 hours or that 20 hours before I give up, that all of those pushes, all of those efforts are actually building a muscle and a, a muscle of peace. And, and I may never get out of fibromyalgia pain um, till the day I die. You know, of course, the ego part of me hopes that I feel better one of these days, but I'm I'm like, maybe this continual effort that it keeps forcing me to put, to put into, you know, peace. I'm like, who knows, maybe when I'm 65, I'm 49 right now, maybe at some point down the road, something clicks into place. And I really identify with spirit, the Holy spirit, the truth, and not my pained body. And then not, and then I have that piece solid. And, and I look back and go, thank God I had all that struggle for all those years because it was what it took to give me this huge accomplishment at the level of mind. Um, so that's kind of the whole story around fibromyalgia. I find that so incredibly touching and moving because there are so many, all of us have experienced pain if we're in this, you know, if we're believing we're in this body. And even if we don't believe in this body, it's very humbling. You know, it can mm -hmm. humble you and cripple you. My mother did this practice for, you know, 45 years and, and, it, you know, she struggled uh, with pain and fibromyalgia. And there were times where I would come in and just tears streaming from her eyes about the pain and how to do the practice within it. And of course, in an ego mind, I, I watched her say, I, I can't stand this. Get me out of this. Mm -hmm. And also do her practice, mm. also do her practice. So the most extraordinary experience that I had of her, her actual death was um, 
if you want to call it a, a death, um, was two twofold. One fold was she gave me the gift of a video that I could share with my brother who was back east and I was in California, saying her saying, I don't, I don't want to be in this pain anymore. I've done my job and I'm complete. I'm ready to go. Mm. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. And then when I was having a response to her body and she would be screaming out in pain, um, because she's having different types of contractions and con, uh, congestive heart failure as well. Um, I, I found myself being upset with her body. Like, I want to make it easier for her. Mm-hmm. And her response was, please don't be mad at my body. It is doing exactly what is supposed to be. It's supposed to be doing to kick me out of here or I wouldn't leave. Whoa. You know, I would still stay and work and her work ethic was like none I'd ever seen. It was 24 seven. And she <laughs> said, it is my time and it needs to kick me out because I don't want to stay here in this pain. anymore." Mm. So there are so many functions uh, that we don't even know. And what it allowed me to do with her as she was passing was partner with her and her body and extend love every mm. time she screamed. She said, I've never felt so peaceful in my life. Don't be upset Whoa. with my body. And so I started to kiss her all over. And I said, good body. Thank you for doing your job. Thank you for taking the hits for 90 years for a person who never did a day of exercise in her mm. life. I'm sorry <laughs> that that you responded by giving her pain, but you took that pain, you know, as, as she did her life's work that she needed to be here for. And thank you. And thank you for kicking her out now because it's her time. And thank you for her being able, her practice to be able to give her the experience of not only peace, but literally melting into peace and love as she, wow. as she moved out, finally free from that pain which, you know, still to this day, you know, I'm just starting to feel the morning of, is she, is she gone really? Because she evanesced into everything. And that pain was just part of the ego. And, and it was so, she made it so clear for me to see, but it doesn't mean it's easy or you can rise above the pain. Uh. You work with it in whatever uh, your story as and your story may very well be that it actually disappears because because your story may be that you get to a place where it isn't relevant mm-hmm. you know so unrelevant for you it just isn't there and the other is maybe it is there as some strange companion of burning up karma if you believe in that or yeah. you know, a million different stories that we can make of it in this world but I can tell you that my mother was, you know, as you know, she was touched by both of your journeys, um, you know, knowing mm. you well. She was so deeply touched by how you both worked with the course, with the pain, and sometimes wanted to take the course and put it in you know, a fire, yes. a fireplace and go burn in hell with my pain, you know. Yep. Yep. But it didn't help. It just, you know, you had to kind of claw right. your way back to it and go, oh, well, you do give me something. Okay. Right. um, but but that detachment from it of her looking at me like boring into my eyes saying i have pay no attention and don't get upset with it because that's paying attention i have never been it's so much peace in my life and her last words to me were i am so lucky and that were screams literal screams Mm. Um, yeah, it looked like she was giving birth, like something was punching her stomach out, like a baby was kicking inside her. And literally, um, it, it, it was gas that was building up, but literally doing contractions and punching her stomach. And I told it and my compassion was like, oh, no. And it was like, oh, no, don't go there. Stay with what she's really talking about here. Wow. Great so. points. So, so many questions you entertain about the body and pain, and you probably heard Judy entertain about the body and pain and how do you deal with it? So huge theme there. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how, how dualistic, you know, that you're talking about Judy, she's saying I'm at peace and her body's like screaming in pain. It's like, there's yeah. going to be more example of a dualistic going on there. 
No, it's extraordinary. My grandmother, who was the nicest person ever, everyone just thought, oh my God, there's no one nicer than Bobby. She got shingles in, later in her 80s and she was mean as <laughs> mean for that you know that time and she said oh my gosh I finally understand what I've never been in pain my body hasn't been in pain I finally understand what people go through um it it brings information but enough is enough <laughs> you know there's also enough is enough um, so thank you for bringing that up so honestly and so um in such a beautiful raw way of uh the because as a core student, it gets confusing. Yeah. You, you know, I just, I wanted to say that um, it, it's confusing in my mind on how to look at it. Um, because, you know, one part of me, since I've been learning about, you know, trauma and trauma therapy and that sort of stuff says that, you know, all of this repressed pain in one's mind can manifest itself as all sorts of different physical symptoms. And so sometimes I think of, you know, this is a physical pain because I haven't processed, you know, early emotional trauma. And, and then I, from that perspective, I, you know, I think, oh, I, you know, need to do, you know, therapy to work, to clear that trauma. Um, but then from that other perspective, two perspectives of, well, it's a tool that is helping me really giving me the reason to do a practice at a level of commitment that I wouldn't do otherwise. Um, from that perspective is it's a whole different story, um, of honoring of what the pain is making possible. And, you know, I, I'm just thinking of, you know, disappearance of the universe sort of uh, alludes to multiple lives and all that sort of stuff. And, and I think, if, you know, I'm not sure what my belief is on reincarnation, all that stuff, but I think, man, if, if I go through this and really do some good work because of this pain and it saves me, you know, future miserable lifetimes or whatever, then I'll be so darn grateful. I don't know <laughs> if that's true. I don't know if I believe it, but I just sort of hold it on the side of like, you know, there could be some real benefits to this that I'm not even aware of um, that I may learn about in the future. Yeah. And, and, and there may be, and again, we go back and forth, you know, that in the world of form, you know, um, that's stories and all those stories can have truth in, there can be light in them to lead us home. Um, and they can make us feel better along the way, or they can torture us along the way. Yeah. So, you know, my, as a writer, there's a lot about which story do I want to choose right now? Uh, the drama story that's so intriguing or peace. Yeah. Or peace or peace, you know, and leave the drama to profession and writing rather than living it necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. How do I bring in the peace? And uh, so it, it all may be true in the world of form. Anything we think may be true in the world of form, but we know what truth really is. And, you know, it, it's not all the stories. Yeah. Derek, Derek, we try to be really practical and help listeners and ourselves come up with tool sets to how to practice forgiveness, to feel better. Uh, you, you mentioned like, I just want to feel better. Um, you know, when we're kids in school, they talk about the stop, drop and roll to put out a fire. When you're caught in the ego's fire of pain and projection and blame and guilt, sin, fear, all these things that come up, you mentioned journaling baths. What, what's kind of your go-to thing that helps you get into a forgiveness mindset as much as possible? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm just, I'm noticing that uh, like where my mind is going uh, right, right from you asking this question, I, I wasn't, I'm like, oh, I don't have an answer for this. And I guess what's coming to mind is that num number one is, even after working on this sort of stuff for decades, um, I, I still get caught up in, in stuff uh, uh, triggered a, a fair number of times to where I just have to write it out. And, and I wish I could say that I had a tool or a technique or a practice that I, um, you know, went to consistently, um, but there's, there's still a, there's a, there's a whole, you know, set of times to this day 
that, you know, I get triggered or I'm in pain and I'm judgmental and I don't catch it. And then it sort of dissipates over hours or a day or two. And, and then I start reflecting upon it afterwards. And um, I'm learning to not judge myself for just being human. And, you know, that happens. Um, I don't know that there's a specific, like, cause there's a, there's a certain amount of time now where fairly quickly, like I'm here at work and, you know, sometimes uh, uh, an email will come in where a person's frustrated and, and I'll notice for whatever reason that I get triggered by it. And my solar plexus twists up and there's this tendency to want to respond to that email with a snippy response and sort of like, you know, and I'm, and much of the time now, thanks to all of this practice, I'm really sort of the observer and I'm like, whoa, Derek, look at this, this physiological reaction. Look at your defensiveness. Look at you wanting to write the, that scathing email back. And because I have practiced sort of that observer, you know, watching the ego um, consciousness, I, I can almost, I would say 29 times out of 30, I can catch it and sort of talk myself off the ledge uh, at which point I might take a walk. Um, I may journal. I, that's, that's work for me. I used to do it a ton. I don't do it so much anymore. So now I might take a walk and really, you know, mull over course principles, that sort of thing, and just let the energy dissipate. Um, so that's kind of the, what's coming to me at the moment. And that, you know, is interesting that you said stop, drop and roll. And one of the things we've been talking about, one of the course groups is um, to stop, drop, listen, uh, ask, and listen. Mm. Yeah, I think that was it. I might have switched it around a bit, but yes, there is something about stopping, dropping to our knees, you know, yeah. like asking and then listening. I oh, This is just to wrap this up. This is funny. This just happened the other night. My partner and I, we watched The Bachelor. And Bachelorette, unabashedly, I'm just saying that. <laughs> and forgive you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, currently on the current season we're watching, there's two women on there, and they are vicious egos. And I'm noticing that both me and my partner are watching them, and the the notion in my mind, my partner, we both we we team up on being egos. We're like they are so mean and vicious. And they need to get what's coming to them. And so you're watching episode to episode. When are they going to get called out? When is he going to boot them off the island? You know, it's like, when are they going to get theirs? And I just caught myself the last night. My girlfriend was, was thinking this and sort of not catching herself. She was just, yeah, I, I don't like them. And that can't believe they did this and all that stuff. And as I went to the bat, I got up from the, from the, where we we're watching the, the, the show and I walked to the bathroom. And it just hit me. I was like, I, Holy spirit, I do not want to see these two. They're wounded. They're wounded egos. If you will. Uh, that's sort of from my trauma training thing. These are wounded inner children. These are survival strategies. They're vicious because something painful happened in the past. And I'm like, I want to see the bigger picture and have compassion for them because I know that if I'm attacking them and I want them to get what they deserve, then I'm, I'm just saying, Hey, I want me to get what I deserve for all the quote unquote ways that I'm still an ego. And it just, I was like, no, no, I compassion for them, compassion for myself. I let this go. So the next time that we were watching an episode and she was starting to get into, Oh, I can't believe these girls are acting like that. I, I didn't jump on the bandwagon with my partner. I just, I sort of like kept my mind with the Holy spirit and just blessed everybody and everything. And, and that was, uh, I feel like that was a breakthrough for me and catching, stopping, dropping, asking for that peace. And, um, now I'm no longer attacking those two ladies. And, and that's horrible for the entertainment industry, by the way. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because yeah, the whole purpose of it is to get you involved to believing it's, you know, in what it's, it's you know, putting out. So yeah, it, it is a funny practice. And if we can do that in movies, then it, it's a wonderful 
practice because I get so involved in movies. Uh, uh, and the whole point of entertainment is to allow you to forget yourself. And it's a time where you're not thinking about your own problems if you really can get involved in a movie and it's a good movie and they make you believe it. And uh, But it in the commitment to step back and see it as a movie and see this life as a movie, um, there is a detachment and there's the ego saying it's not going to be as much fun, mm-hmm. you know, it, and then it's, it's, then it moves to non-attachment. Um, and then it's all one. And we see why it's so much fun. We yeah. see the joke of it with the laughter of it, but it is a first step. Like you might not have as much fun watching that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. There's an interest if you're, if you're neutral. Yeah, Mike, just, I'll go, go ahead, ahead, Matt. I was just saying, as a kid, I remember, you know, I would get into fights in grammar school and I, I would see other people get into fights. The first thing that would happen is everybody forms a circle yes. and watches the fight. Like, oh, get one in. Go. Oh. Oh. And it's like, what is that? It's so perverse. But we, yeah. I, do it. I did it. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's drama. Yeah. It's, it's the ego going, this is, look, this is real. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, it's so, it's so, it was so juicy for me and her to judge these women. But when I, when I started reflecting on it, I'm like, there it is. I've been in an emotional places in my life of being victimized by others, judged by others, all sorts of things. And it's, it's felt so bad, so horrible. It's no joke. It's like, Oh my God, what I'm getting my kicks on attacking these people, the consequences of that high in the bigger picture across everybody's, the, the whole universe of, of, you know, emotion, people and emotions, like it's not worth it. Um, that's what's starting to become clear to me. Well, that, that shows years of course, practice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really does. I mean, uh, you know, very few people understand innately um, how our thoughts affect this world yeah. and which we which ones we need to choose um, for that piece if we want it. Mm-hmm. Well, The Bachelorette's coming on here shortly in Portugal, so I got to wrap this up. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. But Derek, what wonderful forgiveness stories you have. Thank you so much for your miracle voice and for coming on and sharing those. It helps. It's helped me. I'm sure it's helped you too, Tam, and it's helped all the listeners. And we just want to say thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. This has been wonderful. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Mm